And welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker. We've been going through the book of Colossians, and we've been going verse by verse. The last time we finished up chapter 2. A lot of good stuff in chapter 2, uh, especially doctrinal stuff, very, very doctrinal things in chapter 2 of Colossians. Probably one of my favorite verses of Colossians 2.13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. That's one of the best verses in the Bible. Because it tells us that when Jesus died on the cross, he forgave us of all our sins. You know, there's some people out there that think, well, you know, when you're forgiven of your sins, you know, that only forgives the certain sins that you've done up until that point. And if you sin after that, well, then you have to ask God to forgive you over and over again. What? You know, if you ask God to forgive you, you know what you're doing? You're saying, uh, what you did on the cross for me was meaningless and meant nothing to me, and uh, I don't believe that it saved me, so I'm asking you to save me again, or to clean me, or to forgive me again. Either you're forgiven by the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ forever, or you're not. So what should we do when we sin? Well, we should definitely apologize, say, Lord, I did wrong, I'm sorry, and I hate it. But we don't say, oh God, please forgive me again. If we're for saved, we are forgiven. So once saved, always saved. Yes, that's a Bible doctrine. And you're saved, you're saved of past, present, and future sins. Now that's not an excuse to sin again. But when the Bible says we're saved from all trespasses, that means all of our sins are forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. And another good verse to tie in with that is Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So we have forgiveness of sins. And the, that means we have forgiveness of all trespasses. So remember that. Colossians is a great book to talk about that. And last time we looked a little bit about what happens when you get saved. There's the spiritual circumcision that takes place where God literally cuts your soul away from your body and melts His Holy Spirit inside. So now you're what the Bible calls a new creature in Christ. So when you sin, it's not the new creature inside that's sinning. It's not the soul that sins. It's the body that sins. And we're going to see today, here when we get to chapter 3, that there's something that we should do to this body. And uh, it's an interesting verse here. Um, it tells us in verse 5 to mortify that body. Mortify means to kill. Just as Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross of Calvary, willingly, every day of our lives as Christians, we should willingly give ourselves as a living sacrifice to God and to mortify our members and say, Flesh, I know you want to do what you want to do, but I want to serve Jesus and I want to live for God. Now, it's not easy. I get emails from people all the time. What do I do? It's so hard for me to live right. And it seems like I'm sitting all the time. Well, go read Romans chapter 7. And uh, look at what Paul says. You know, he says, The things that I would not, those I do, and the things that I would, I do not. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this flesh? Well, the answer is Jesus Christ. After the church age, at the rapture, this is the rapture that delivers us from the body of this flesh. So I can't wait for the rapture to get out of this sinful, wicked body. The sooner, the better. So that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at chapter 3. And I just wanted to go back and kind of remind us of what we were looking at before. And uh, we're looking at salvation. Salvation is wonderful. Salvation is forgiveness of sins and all of our trespasses, past, present, and future, saved. But what's saved is the soul. Only our soul is saved. The rapture is when the body is saved. So that's what we're waiting for is the salvation of the body. The body is not saved. That's why Christians sin. If you get a chance, check out my YouTube video on can a Christian sin. The answer is yeah. yeah. Christians can do some horrible things and be mean and say awful things. But that doesn't mean they lose their salvation. They might lose some fellowship with God, but you can't lose your salvation because you're a new creature in Christ. And it's called the purchased possession, that new creature. It belongs to God. If he purchased you say, what did he purchase it with? With his own blood, Acts 20, 28. So your soul is a purchased possession that belongs to God. He put his Holy Spirit inside of it. And that soul is going to heaven when you die. 
no matter what is done in this flesh, the soul is still saved and belongs to God. Now, that's not an excuse to go do whatever you want in the body. You know, people say, well, then you're saying that I can go do whatever I want. I never said that. Matter of fact, this chapter that we'll read today tells us that we're to be reckoned dead, we're to mortify our flesh, we view ourselves as dead in Christ. And so, we don't give in to the desires of the flesh. So let's begin here. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So, when we're saved, we're risen with Christ. Christ died, was buried, and rose again. Well, we get the Holy Spirit inside of us, so it's like our soul is risen with Jesus. Our soul is saved. We have eternal life in the soul. But our body's not saved yet. <laughs> We're still in a sinful, wicked flesh. That's why when the rapture comes, we get a glorified body. So it says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So we need to seek things above. We're supposed to set our affection on things above, not on things of the earth as we've read in a verse before. Now, verse 2, set your... Well, that's the very next verse, so we haven't read it before. And verse 2 says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. I've got a note here from my old Bible school teacher. I wrote a lot of notes when I was sitting in class, listening to him go verse by verse, teaching. And right here it says, the most violated commandment in the entire New Testament. <laughs> What is the most violated commandment in the entire New Testament? Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. You see, the problem with many Christians today is they live in the flesh, they live on the earth. And so they go around with fleshly eyes and an earthly demeanor, and all they look about is the things down here. Well, you know, okay. What are, what are the things down here? Job money, uh, marriage, uh, house, you know, all these things that the world has to offer, you know, like uh, maybe a new car, or oh, what a lot of things that men like, you know, men like to go hunting, um, there's some men that love hunting more than they love Jesus, you know, all these different things that people who claim to be Christians think about day after day after day. That's all they care about. When a Christian is supposed to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh, and he's supposed to think about the things above. Well, what are things above? Jesus Christ, our redemption of our body, his soon coming, the rewards that you can get for serving Jesus. One time when I was in Bible school, there was a, a man and his wife, he hadn't been very much, married long, and they hadn't been saved very long. He, he actually kind of looked like a little hippie a little bit still, <laughs> and uh, his wife too. I drove kind of a hippie car. And uh, we were talking one time, he invited us over to his trailer to talk, and we're sitting there, and this young man said to me one, thi one thing, because I was talking about some things, and it was, it was obvious that his mind was on the things of the earth. As a matter of fact, he never finished Bible school. I think he went one year and he quit. I, I guess it was just too much for him to think about the things above. And we were talking, and I, I kind of rebuked him a little bit. And he says, he looked at me, he goes, well, you know what your problem is? And I'm like, I don't have any problems, but okay, sure. What, what, what's my problem? He said, he looked at me and he goes, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. And I looked at him and I go, amen, amen. The Bible says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And, and amen, that's what I'm doing and you can see that in me. So, all right, praise the Lord. He meant it not as a compliment. He was saying it's a put down. He was saying, you know, you all you do is go around and think about the Bible all the time, and you don't think about the things of the earth. You know, you got to work, you got to do this. Okay, I understand. He was trying to put me down by saying you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. And you know what I said to him? Kind of, you know, maybe I was a little wrong to rebuke him, but then at the same time, looking back, he he was pretty worldly. He, he kind of needed that rebuke. I said, well, you know what your problem is, right? You're so earthly minded, you're no heavenly good. <laughs> and he didn't like that. If I remember correctly, he asked me to leave. And, I, you know, I was single at the time. I said, hey, no sweat, man. I'll see you right later. God bless, you know. I liked the guy. I liked his wife. They were nice folks. But they were just kind of worldly and uh, cared more about the things of the world than the things of God. And, and here I was wanting to talk about God and the Bible. You know, when you're in Bible school, man, you're, you're learning about the Bible. You want to be another Christian and talking about the Bible, not talking about the things of the world. Like, well, here's a good one, movies. 
I can't tell you how many times I get together with other Christians and and it's very quickly I can tell if I like fellowshipping with these people or no. Because you get around other Christians and they go, hey, did you see that latest movie? And they start talking about the mov mov movies of the world and the music of the world and it's just like, it's vexing to me. It's like, can't we talk about something else? <laughs> you know, these are all worldly things that I don't give a hoot about. I want to talk about Jesus, the Bible, things of God. Some of my best times in life that I can remember were Thursday night at Bible school. When I was in Bible school over in Pensacola, we would go every night from 6 to 10 at night. It was a night Bible school. It was called the Bible Institute. And we would go to this Bible Institute and we'd go all week long. I, I didn't have to go on Friday night. Friday night was four hours of English class. And uh, I actually went one year of, of college and had English both semesters, so I didn't have to take the English in the Bible Institute, which was great. So I had Friday nights free. But I went Monday through Friday, 6 till 10, every one of those nights. And Thursday night, me and some other Christians, some of my other brothers in Christ about my age, we didn't have a lot of money, so we'd go to uh, Burger King after school. So 10, 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, after Bible school, we'd go to Burger King, and usually I had a dollar in my pocket, and I'd scrounge up some change, and just, we'd just sit there and eat French fries, and we'd talk about the Bible. And that was some of the best times that I can remember in my life. And usually it was just two or three of us. Sometimes it might have been four or five. It's whoever had the money and, and didn't have to worry about staying up so late because they had to get up early and work in the morning and would come. And we'd sit there and, and I remember talking about the Lord and the Bible. I remember the brother saying, man, I've been reading my Bible this week and during the day. And, um, man, did you know this? Did you know? And, and oh, wow, what'd you think about this? And just sitting around that table and having communion with other Christians and talking about the Word of God. Whew, some of the best times of my life. Thinking about things above and not things down here. I'll never forget that. I wish we could do that every Thursday night, every night of my life, really, being around other Christians. I was in Massachusetts one time, and there was a missionary that came down, and I was staying in the house of a man, and we had some of the most profound Bible studies that I've ever had in my entire life, sitting around that table, and that man's house in Massachusetts, and I just, wow, thinking about things above rather than things down here. So the Bible says, set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Well, the problem with many Christians is they're so earthly minded, they're no heavenly good. And if someone wants to put me down and say, I'm so heavenly minded, I'm no earthly good, then I say, praise God. That's good. Verse 3, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Well, I'm not dead, I'm, I'm here talking. So obviously it's saying you are dead, it's not saying that, that your body is dead because we're alive. But you're, you're supposed to reckon the flesh dead. So the body, you're supposed to say this body is dead. And I'm dead in my soul, my soul is dead to sin. Okay? Uh, my soul can no longer sin because it's a purchased possession. What sins is the body. Now I'm in this body and he says you are dead. Okay, so what do I do? If God says the body's dead and yet I'm alive and kicking, what is he talking about? Well, Christ died and he, when he died, his body died and he rose again. I'm buried with Christ and risen with him. So my body is supposed to be dead. That means I don't give in to the desires of the flesh. I'm supposed to serve the Lord and walk in the Spirit. Let me show you this in Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. So I'm supposed to take this body that I'm in, and I'm not supposed to give in to it. I'm not supposed to give in to its desires. I'm not supposed to do wrong. I'm supposed to reckon the flesh dead. Paul tells us in Galatians 5, 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these two are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So I have a fight every day of my life as a Christian. I'm supposed to reckon the flesh dead, but yet it's not dead because I'm still alive. One old preacher said it this way one time. He says, we're all a bunch of zombies, <laughs> if you think about it. What is a zombie? A zombie is the walking dead. <laughs> so if you're a lost person, you're a zombie. Why do you say that a lost person is a zombie? Well, here's a lost guy, okay? A lost guy... He's got a soul inside of his body. 
and inside of his body is nothing. It's just spiritually dead. So this is a lost guy, and he's dead spiritually. So what is he? You've got a body, you've got a soul, and a spirit. Every person that's born in this world are born without a spirit. They have a dead spirit, so they're dead spiritually. So that makes them two-thirds of a man, and two-thirds in fraction form is .666. So we have zombies walking around. We have everybody that's born into this world, they're lost, they're not saved yet, so they don't have a new birth, they don't have a live spirit inside of them, so what are they? They're dead. They're walking zombies. Every person that's ever been born is the walking dead. They're a dead spirit walking around in a live body. Now, what happens when you get saved? When you're saved, look at this. You're alive spiritually, but you're dead how? Well, you've got a new spirit, but the flesh is dead. So you're, you're dead. Let me see if I can explain this here. Here you are, okay? Oh boy, sure didn't roll that right away. Very good. So you're, either way, you're a walking zombie. Here you are, when you get saved, your soul is inside your body, okay? In comes the Holy Spirit of God and dwells inside of you. And as we saw last time in Colossians chapter 2, God does what's called a spiritual circumcision where He literally cuts away your soul from your body. So when He cuts away your soul from your body, the only thing that's keeping you in there is the Holy Spirit. So you're alive spiritually. This guy over here, he's, al he's only alive physically. Okay, let me see if I can get this to where you can understand it. Lost guy. He's born into this world. He's not whole. He's two-thirds of a man. He is dead spiritually when he's walking. So he's a live body with a dead spirit walking around. He's a zombie. Oh, he can do whatever he wants in the flesh because he's alive, but inside he's just as dead as a doornail. No spirit of God inside him or nothing. Then he gets saved. What happens when you get saved? God comes along with this knife. And as we read, the spiritual circumcision, God cuts away the flesh from the soul, and the Holy Spirit of God comes inside your soul and makes a new creature. So as this guy was alive physically, but spiritually dead, this guy is alive spiritually, but now he's physically dead. <laughs> so what is he? He's a zombie. You see, I am a live spirit walking around in a body that's worthless, that's good for nothing. It's a horrible body that's that it's still it's still alive in the sense that I can move and do all this stuff. But in God's eyes, this is just a dead body. It's nothing. It's worthless. When do I get my real life glorified body? At the rapture. So I'm still two thirds of a man as a Christian. So like the old preacher said, he said they're all a bunch of zombies. You see, this guy's a zombie because he's a live body with a dead spirit. But this guy, me that's saved, I'm a dead body with a live spirit inside. So we're all a bunch of zombies. <laughs> Do you get that? Now you say, I don't understand. How can you say that the body is dead? Well, God says you're to reckon the flesh dead back in Romans. And here in verse 3, he says, For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So we are dead to this world when we become saved. Because now we are of Christ. So we still have to live in this body, but we're dead to the world. So either way, you're a zombie. Now, for you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Okay, so when Christ shall appear, we'll appear with him in glory. What does that mean? If I die before Jesus comes, my body goes down to the grave. So my dead body is down here, and my soul goes to heaven. Paul says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Rapture comes, my body is going to appear with him. That dead body is going to be brought to life at the rapture. And my soul will come into that body, and that body will be a glorified body. I'll no longer be two-thirds 
I'll be complete. I'll be whole. I will have God's spirit, so my spirit's not dead. I'll have my soul, which is alive. And I'll have a new body, a spiritual body, but yet it's still physical enough. Jesus Christ, when he rose again, he had a physical body. But it was something that could change form. It could travel the speed of light. It could go through doors. It could change back and forth. And it'll be complete and be perfect. It'll be a glorified body. So when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Yeah, I will appear with Christ in glory in a glorified body. My soul will be in glory if I die before the rapture. If I'm alive before the rapture, then when Jesus comes, I'll have a changed body and I'll appear with him in glory. Verse 5, mortify therefore. Okay, so he says, therefore, because of all this that I just told you, mortify your members which are upon the earth. So what are the members that we're supposed to mortify? Mortify your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So Paul gives us a list here of some things that we're supposed to mortify. Now mortify means kill. So when this flesh that we're supposed to reckon dead, this dead flesh, wants something, we're not supposed to allow it to have what it wants. We're supposed to fight the flesh. And there's some things that this flesh wants. This flesh wants fornication. There are times when this sinful flesh looks at a woman and goes, Whoa. Or if you're a woman and looks at a man and goes, Ooh, he's so handsome. And then your body starts thinking dirty thoughts of, Oh, I'd sure like to get with her. Or, Boy, I'd sure like him to get with me. And what is that? That's fornication. Uncleanliness. Inordinate affections. What are inordinate affections? Affections towards things that you shouldn't have affections towards. Sounds like homosexuality where God says in Romans, you know, a man is not supposed to be with a man or a woman with a woman. Something like that. And covetousness, which is idolatry. Now what is covetousness? Covetousness is wanting something that is not yours. I was with my dad one time. I think I told this story before. And um, we're driving down the road in my dad's truck. And my dad says, boy, we passed a nice, beautiful boat. My dad said, boy, I'd sure like to own that boat right there. And there was a bit of a silence, and then I said, Dad, that's covetousness. <laughs> and my dad goes, huh? I go, Dad, isn't that covetousness? The Bible says, thou shalt not covet. You said, I want that boat right there. Isn't that sin to want that boat right there? And my dad goes, you know, you're right, son. I said, Dad, would it be wrong to say I want a boat like that one? <laughs> my dad goes, no. There's nothing wrong with wanting a boat. But we both agree the sin is wanting that one that belonged to that guy. <laughs> it's a sin to want something that belongs to someone else. But if it was for sale, it wouldn't be a sin to want it. Or if you saw it and said, but that's a beautiful boat. I wish I had one just like it. It's not a sin to want one just like it. The sin of covetousness is wanting the one that he has. Do you see that? And that was something, that was one of those aha moments, you know, with my dad. And um, so... Which is idolatry. So covetousness is idolatry because you're idolizing that thing and saying, oh, I wished I had that. And the sin is wanting it because it was someone else's. Now, also it's a sin to idolize something. What if my dad idolized the boat so much that he says, I want that more than anything else? Well, then that's a different sin. He's made it his idol. So basically he... He wants a boat more than he wants Jesus. Huh? It's not wrong to want something. It's a wrong to want it so much that it becomes your idol, and that becomes the most important thing in your life. Verse 6, Which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Now, Paul's talking here. Let me go back to this. Mortify on therefore your members which are upon the earth. And then he tells us, Mortify these members, these things that the flesh wants. This is a good time to go back to Galatians, which we've studied already. And look at what's called the works of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5. And we have a contrast here in Galatians chapter 5 of the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. You see, when you're saved, you have this flesh to deal with. And it's dead. And you're supposed to reckon the flesh dead. Even though we're alive and we can move around in it, God looks at it as that flesh is dead and it's worthless. You are now the new creature inside. That's the real you. You still have to endure in this stupid body till you get a glorified body. But the real you is the soul with my spirit inside. Now the flesh has desires. 
but the fruit of the Spirit is what the Spirit gives us, the fruit of salvation. So let's look at those quickly. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 18. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. So we're supposed to be led of the Spirit of God that's in us. We're supposed to do what God tells us to do. And He's inside of us, directing us what to do. So like zombies, we're moving this body that's dead to go do what God wants. But, oftentimes, Christians say, no, I'd rather serve the flesh. Well, let's see what are the differences between the works of the flesh and the works of the Spirit, or the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are this, which are these. Uh, the works of the flesh are manifest, manifest which are these. Adultery, fornication. Well, that's exactly what he told us over there in Colossians. Uh, mortify your members, get rid of fornication and uncleanliness. So adultery, fornication, uncleanliness. Then he says lasciviousness. All right, he inserts one here that he didn't talk about over in Colossians. What is un lasciviousness? Well, from what I understand, looking it up, the word lasciviousness has to do with unbridled sex. It's like orgies. It's like having no restraint whatsoever. It's like Whoever will sleep with me, I'll go sleep with them, type thing. What a horrible way to live. That's being led of the flesh. And boy, that leads to disease. You know how many people have sexually transmitted diseases that are like that? They call it free love. It's not love and it's not free. You will pay for it if you commit fornication. You will get diseases. You will have uh, many, many, many sexually transmitted diseases that you would to God you didn't catch. Because they are painful and evil and, and horrible and, and can cause all sorts of different bodily harm. Then he says in verse 20, idolatry. Well, that's what he said over there, covetousness, which is idolatry. But here he also mentions in verse 20, Galatians 5, 20, witchcraft. A work of the flesh is witchcraft. A lot of people don't know what witchcraft is, but witchcraft is communicating with demons and making deals with demons for them to do something for you. That's what witchcraft is. It's, it's saying chants and saying different things, and the reason you chant and say those different spells is that you're binding demons to come do something for you. But don't ever think that that doesn't come without a cost. Demons don't just do stuff for fun. Uh, they're expecting to get something out of it. And oftentimes, they'll do whatever they're told to do, and then they'll come back and demand something back. That's why you should always stay away from witchcraft. It's evil, evil. Then it says, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. I went through one time and I counted all the works of the flesh and I came up with 18 works of the flesh that's mentioned in this passage. You know what 18 is? 6 plus 6 plus 6. <laughs> Quite interesting. That couldn't be an accident. And uh, he says, and such like, I counted such like as number 18. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you also, in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now people say, well then they're not safe. No, 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 no. The word inherit means your inheritance. After the rapture, when we who are saved get our glorified body, we go before the judgment seat of Christ to see what our inheritance is. And our inheritance are the rewards we receive for Jesus. So when it says, such that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, that means what you do in the body, you don't get a reward for. But what you do in the flesh, I mean in the spirit, you do get a reward for. So if you do any of these things which are the work of the flesh, don't expect to receive a reward in heaven. A reward in heaven. Now verse um, 22. But the fruit of the spirit is, and there's nine fruits of the spirit. Nine, of course, being the number of fruit in the Bible. And what's interesting is they're divided three, three, and three. The first one is three that are in me. The other are three that are toward others that I practice outward. And the other three are toward God. And it says here, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Okay, love, joy, and peace are all things that I can have inside of me. When you're saved, you have a great peace. And you have joy and you begin to love other Christians. Then it says long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. Well, if I'm going to be long-suffering and gentle and good, I have to practice that toward others. That's something that I should be toward other people. And then, it says, faith, meekness, and temperance. I should have faith, and my faith should be in the gospel, in Christ, in God. Meekness, I should be meek toward the Lord. I should be humble. And temperance. So, it says, against such there is no law. 
And verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So that's part of the Christian life is crucifying the flesh every day, mortifying the members of the flesh every day, saying, my flesh wants this. No, I'm going to walk in the Spirit. And it goes on and on. So let's go back to Colossians chapter 3. So once again, verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Verse 6, For which things say the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. It's interesting, he says, now those things that lost people do, God is angry with them. So if God is angry with the lost people that do that, don't you think God will be angry with you for doing that? <laughs> yeah? And so what will he do? Well, the Bible says you reap what you sow. What you do in the flesh, you will reap. If you're saved, you're not going to pay for those sins. You're not going to go to purgatory. There's no such thing. You're not going to go to hell and burn. Your sins are paid for by the blood of Christ. That's not an excuse to go sin some more, but... When we're saved, what we lose are rewards. And God can judge us in this world. Let's say I go sleep with a fornic and fornicate with a hooker or a prostitute. Well, what if I get gonorrhea? What if I get something like that? Well, then I've reaped what I've sowed in the flesh, and that's God's judgment on me. So that would be what it's talking about. When you're saved, you can't go to hell, but you can pay in your flesh. Paul talks about it as you reap what you sow. Now, verse 7, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. So he says, you used to do those things. Now he's implying, but now you don't. You see, when you lived in them, when your body was alive and you were spiritually dead, well now you're spiritually alive, now reckon the flesh dead. Make a change. Live a different life. Don't go do those things. Don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It doesn't please the Lord. He doesn't want you to do that. And then he says here in verse 8, But now ye also put off all these. Now notice he says put off, and then he tells you some things that you put off. But you go down to verse 10, it says now put on. Verse 12 starts put on. And so what he's doing here, he's going to say, here's some things that you need to put off which means quit. And he says, now here's some things that you need to put on. So that's what he's talking about here. Put off and put on. Let's look at what the things are that we should put off or quit and the things that we need to put on. Verse 8. But now ye also put off all these. So what should we put off? What should we quit? What should we stay away from as Christians? What he mentions verse 5. Fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And then he says also, he gives us some more, verse 8. Now, put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Now see, this almost sounds like what we read in Galatians, the works of the flesh. One of them was heresy. Well, that would correspond with blasphemy. He talked about anger. Well, here's anger. Um, so it says, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds. So here he tells us how to speak. He begins to deal with our mouths. And he says, there's some things that shouldn't come out of your mouth. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So Christians should not use dirty words. It's interesting to me how from time to time I'll get emails from people that claim to be Christians and there's an F word here and an S word there and a D word here and, and it's like, have they read the Bible? Are they new Christians or, or have, uh, are they really Christians at all? Or maybe they are, they're just in the flesh, you know? All those questions come to my mind, and you know, I'm not perfect. I had a guy tell me the other day, you know, sometimes that, that one word comes back and I say it without thinking. I said, well, we're all flesh. We're all in this evil flesh. Mortify it. Kill it. Put it off. Don't do it again. It's hard sometimes, but you got to do it. You've got to try to serve the Lord. And when you do that, you can get some rewards in heaven. So, put off. And it says, filthy communication out of your mouth. That means Christians are not supposed to tell dirty jokes. It means a Christian shouldn't use bad words and bad language. That means a Christian shouldn't attack and put down and ridicule and make fun of and lie about others. Hmm. Interesting. And then it says here in verse 8, 
Uh, let's go to verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. We shouldn't be lying about others or to others. Now verse 10 says what to put on. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So the new man is the new creature. That's what the new man is. And we have put on Christ because we have Christ's spirit in us. So we need to take those things that the world does and the flesh does we need to be different from the world so the world can look at us and say, wow, there's a difference in this guy. Why is he so different? Now it says, verse 11, When there is neither Greek, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, barbarian Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So when we're in Christ, we're neither Greek nor Jew. We're neither this or that. We're not this or that. We're all the same in Christ. How? We've all become a new creature in Christ. So verse 12, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Notice that. We who are Christians, we should put off all the bad communication out of our mouth and all the bad desires and thoughts of the flesh and we should, as Christians, be holy and beloved. We should have bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. I've met a lot of Christians that do not do that. They're not humble. They have no meekness. They're not beloved. They don't live a holy life. And they're not long-suffering at all. Are they even Christians? That's my question. I mean, a true Christian, yeah, they can get in the flesh, but should they? Uh, no. Verse 13, forbearing one another. You know what forbearing means? It means putting up with one another. Now, I've said it before, and I don't like to even talk about it, but there's some uh, YouTube videos against me. I think you can type in rubber breaker exposed or something like that and see what appears to me to be mocking, making fun, putting down, attacking, uh, ridiculing, lying about me which is fine. Uh, you, you give account to God for what you do and say, and I'll give account to God for what I do and say. But the question is, does he really practice what the Bible teaches? Has he put off the old man? <laughs> or is he still trying to put on that old man and serve the flesh? Where is the forbearing one another and forgiving one another? The Bible says forbear one another. What does forbear mean? It means putting up with other another. There are other Christians out there that do things that I don't like. But I have yet to make a video about why I don't like so-and-so. And I'm not going to. I've told you before, if there's another brother out there that's preaching something that's blasphemy or heresy, and it's wrong, and I see that it's affecting other Christians, well, I'll make a video about that subject and say, you know, there's some that teach this, but the Bible teaches this. But I'm not going to attack the person. I'm going to put up with them. I'm going to deal with the issue at hand and say, this is why this teaching is wrong. This is why the Bible says it's right. I'm not even going to give the person the time of day. Because all that will do, most likely, will bring them to anger, wrath, and malice. And the last thing I need, or they need, is to get angry and wrathful and take out their wrath on me. You see, we're supposed to be serving together the Lord, not fighting one another. So... There's a lot of Christians out there that need to learn to have bowels of mercy, some kindness and humbleness of mind, some meekness. They need to learn to forbear one another. Verse 13, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also you do ye. So if you have a problem with me, and I have a problem with you, then guess what? I forgive you as Christ forgave also forgave you and forgave me. I have nothing against you out there who claim to be Christians. Even if I don't like you, even if you make videos lying about me and saying things that aren't true, there have been some people email me and say, what about this guy? He's got this, this big long article against you and says that you're this, this, and this, and they're all lies. I forgive him. I love him. I forbear him. Uh, I pray for him. You know, I wish he'd take down his website with all the lies in it. But if he doesn't, amen. Love you, brother. Amen, brother. I forgive you, even as Christ forgave you. So do I. So that's what the Bible teaches. That's how we as Christians should help each other and love each other, pray for each other, not 
treat each other like the enemy. If we're saved and we're truly saved, we're not the enemy. So instead of fighting one another, let's fight the flesh, first of all, which a lot of them don't do. They give in to the flesh. That's why they are angry and hateful and mean and spiteful and blah, blah, blah. Let's fight the flesh first. Then let's work together to fight the world, the devil, and the evil that we see. Let's preach against sin and let's preach truth. Let's don't attack one another personally. That's just... Just foolish, just childish. Now why? He brings it all together here in verse 14. And this is probably one of the most amazing things that, that the Lord showed me in the Bible in the last couple of years. And I even, when I get around other preachers or other Christians, I, I find myself doing this now more and more. I like to ask them, I say, Brother, um, I just got a Bible question for you. And they go, oh, yeah, what, what's that? I go, Brother, what did both Paul and Peter say was the most important thing above all other things? And a lot of times they'll go, huh, that's a good question. <laughs> well, I'm going to spill the beans today, and you're going to find out. But isn't that a great question? Peter and Paul both said, above all things, this thing right here is the most important. You would think the most important thing is the blood of Jesus Christ. You would think the most important thing is salvation. But no, Peter and Paul both said, above all things, the most important thing is this thing right here. Well, what is that thing? Well, I'm going to show you both places. I'm going to show you Paul first, what he says right here. Then we'll go to 1 Peter and see where Paul, Peter says it as well. But I'll tell you what, if both Peter and Paul said this was above all things, then this must be pretty darn important. Amen? Colossians 3.14, Paul says, And above all these things put on what? Charity. Charity, which is the bond of perfectness. You want to be perfect in Christ? You want to make sure that you're not giving into the flesh? Above all things, practice this one thing, charity. You know what that means? That means I'm going to have to put up with other Christians that I don't like. And I can't, elect, I can't let what they do affect me. You know, there's some Christians that have done some pretty dumb things. I can't immediately in the flesh go, oh, You sorry, dirty brother. I just sinned. And I went against what the Scripture said. I've got to have a little bit of charity. When they do some things, I just have to go, Lord, help them, show them they've done wrong, bless them. If I get a chance to talk to them and we're able to talk, and I can say, Brother, you know, um, the Bible says this, and, and I, I feel personally that you've done something that, that's not right, um, maybe you could consider repenting, getting right with God, humbling yourself. Amen. And uh, if I ever do the same thing, I would appreciate it if you tell that to me too. Amen. We, we should love one another. And charity is sacrificial giving as well as love. I had a guy email me the other day. He goes, isn't the King James Bible wrong by using charity instead of love? I said, no, sir. No, charity is the right word because love, many people today think, is just an emotion. But love is more than an emotion. What Love is an action. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So love is doing something. Well, charity is more than love. Charity is long-suffering. Charity is putting up with others because you love them. It, it's got the connotation of sacrificial giving. Jesus loved us enough to die for him, but it's above all things. His love, his charity is that he put up with us. You see, he didn't have to die for our sins. He sacrificially showed that he loved us through the sacrifice of Christ. So here Paul says, above all things, put on charity. Now let's go to 1 Peter 4.8. You know, I wish, I wish this was the first thing that Christians learned. <laughs> uh, we didn't really learn this in Bible school. This is something I had to learn when I got out. <laughs> but this should be something that's taught so that Christians can learn to love and tolerate and bear one another. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Now notice what he says. Above all things. Well, that's what Paul said. He says, And above all these things. Peter says, above all things, have fervent charity. He even adds a word to it. He says, fervent. He said, you should fervently be working toward being charitable to others. He says, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. If you are a true Christian and you have charity, guess what? That means you will overlook a lot of stupid things that other people do. I have done a lot of stupid things in my life. 
And I hate to admit it, but it's true. And I'm not the only one. You have to. Now, I overlook them. I know God looks, looks at them, and I know they're under the blood, so He overlooks it. Now the question is, do other Christians have charity? Do they overlook it? I uh, hope so. Well, what am I supposed to do as a Christian? If they do something stupid, I'm supposed to have charity. Because charity covers a multitude of sins. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, I run up to them and go, Aha! <laughs> I saw what you did. Isn't that you know, what the devil does? Isn't, isn't, wait a minute, isn't the devil called the accuser of the brethren? Why, yeah, yeah, he is. The devil is the, so the devil is the one that's running around like this, just waiting for a Christian to sin to go, aha! So why would we, as Christians, want to do the work of Satan when the work of God is to practice fervent charity for others? Well, let's go back to Colossians. Let me read this again, just, just so you get it. Put on, verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels and mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, which means putting up with one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. Do ye. I heard a Christian one time say, Well, I don't care what that man did. I can never forgive him. And I thought, Well, then you'll never be perfect. Because Christ commanded us to forgive others. And Paul tells us to forgive others even as Christ hath forgiven us. In verse 14 he says, Above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. There were a lot of sins that we did that we hate, but yet God forgave them. So whatever any man does to us, we should be able to, and it'll be hard. I understand it's hard sometimes. People wrong you. We should be able to forgive them, because if Christ could forgive all sins, we should be able to forgive sinners. And I understand it's tough sometimes, but we should try that. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Now verse 15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body. And I like these three words, And be ye thankful. I've got a Christian brother that sometimes that keeps saying to me, Now brother, do you remember what it says in Colossians chapter 3? And verse, uh, what is the verse there? Verse 15. I go, yeah, brother, I remember. I remember. What does it say, Brother Breaker? And he, he makes me say it. He makes me say it. You know, sometimes you call somebody and you're a little depressed. And, you know, they say, what's going on, brother? And you go, well, these things are going on in our lives. And, you know, you, 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 you feel like, hey, I got a brother there that cares, so he'll listen. And then he's like, he's like, well, what does the Bible say in Colossians 3.15? And you're like, I know, brother, I know. You go, come on, say it. What are those three words? And I have to go, be ye thankful. And he goes, brother, are you thankful? Yes, brother. Even though times are hard sometimes, yes, I'm thankful. Amen. <laughs> I appreciate him. I mean, sometimes that's a blessing. And so I'll always remember these three words, be ye thankful. In the end of Colossians 3.15. It's such great words. So the Bible says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. We that are Christians, we should be peaceful and have peace with other Christians. If there's another Christian out there who's attacking you and ridiculing you and putting you down and being mean, being angry, being hateful, he is in the flesh and not in the spirit. And he is not obeying the word of God. He has no charity. And it's because he has no peace in his heart. And it's probably because he's not thankful. You see, that's the problem. There's a lot of Christians that aren't thankful. What is the word for a person who's not thankful? He's ungrateful. He's ungrateful. I don't see a reason ever for any Christian ever to be ungrateful. Every Christian that's ever lived should be thankful. And he has something to be thankful for. What should he be thankful for? All his trespasses are forgiven. That's something right there to always be thankful for. Uh, it's hard for me to see how a Christian can be so ungrateful. But yet there's many Christians today that are not thankful. But here we go. 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body. Now I'm not going to get into that again. We've already looked at that. But remember, when the church started, it was Jews only. And then it changed to Gentiles. And how we've looked at how the Bible teaches that in Christ, Christ the body is made up of both Jew and Gentile. 
And that's the one body of Christ made up of both Jews and Gentiles. So let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Does God's peace rule in your heart? If it does, it's much easier to be charitable to others. To the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Are you thankful? If you are, it's much easier to be charitable to others and forbear one another and, and put up with them. And verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now notice that. Some of these Christians that go around and all they do is bark like a little dog at other people, you know what they've just shown? That they have no charity, and so they're not perfect, verse 4, because charity is the bondage of perfectness. And in verse 5, they're not letting the word of God dwell in them richly. And verse 15, they have no peace and they're unthankful. So, I want to be a mature Christian. I want to be a Christian who's mature, that doesn't fly off the handle and get offended and get angry and scream at people. I want to be a mature Christian. And the way I do that is I let the Word of God dwell in me richly. Which means I study, I read, I learn, I rightly divide, and I take what it says and I put it in practice in my life. That's why it's so important to study and read the Word of God. Verse 16, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart, hearts to the Lord. So we're to let the Word of God dwell in us richly in all wisdom. The more of the Word of God we learn, the more wise we will be. I'll never forget the first time I went to Honduras. Well, and actually, when I finally got there, the second time I went to Honduras, when I finally got there, I got settled in, I rented a house from another guy that was a missionary, who claimed to be. And he was like 40 years older than me. And uh, we were talking, and we are talking, and we are talking, and I, and I just, I kept noticing that many of the things he was saying was all about things down here. All his focus seemed to be on the things down here. And I was being quiet and meek and nice because he's older than me, but I just kept saying, well, brother, how about this, and how about... And after about an hour of talking with that other missionary, he says, man, brother, he says, you're pretty wise, aren't you? And I was like, are you being smart aleck? I mean, what? He goes, no, no, I'm just talking with you. He goes, I can tell you know the scriptures. You know the word of God. He says, you've said some pretty profound things. And I've only talked with you for an hour. He says, I'm going to go home and look those up. <laughs> and I thought, here, I'm a guy that's 40 years younger than this guy who's been on the mission field for way longer. And he saw something in me that, wow. And, uh. I guess it's the fact that I went to a good Bible school where I learned the Word correctly and that the Word of God dwells in me richly in all wisdom. Now what does it say we're to do as other Christians? We're supposed to teach and admonish one another. So we're supposed to admonish and teach one another. That means we're supposed to say, hey brother, did you know this? Did you know this? Did you know this? And admonish one another. Hey brother, are you teaching this right? How do we do that? It says in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sometimes singing with another Christian is wonderful. Recently, I started a new YouTube channel. I call it the Cloud Church Hymns, I believe it's called. And I posted that on the cloudchurch.org, down on, a little bit down on the bottom on the right. It says, you know, go here to the Hymns channel. And I am not a good singer. I don't claim to be. You know, I've told this story before. I had some sort of lymph nodes or something here on my throat and on my, uh, whatever this thing, Adam's apple when I was younger. And my music teacher said, oh, I don't think he'll ever be able to sing or even speak again. It's just so bad or something. I don't all I remember is my dad said, whatever, don't worry about it. And I trusted my dad. And uh, even to this day, I don't worry about it. I can still talk. But I know one thing, I'm not a good singer. But there are a lot of people that come to the Cloud Church, and they tell me through emails and phone calls that there's no good church in their, in their area. And they can't find a good Christian church. One of the best things to me about going to church is singing hymns. Boy, I love singing hymns. That's why I got the great hymns of faith. And you can get this online, Amazon, eBay, all different places, a well-known hymn book. And on that channel on YouTube, the Cloud Church Hymns, I've begun singing different hymns out of this hymn book. And that way, because there's many people that don't know hymns today, and many people that don't go to church where they hear hymns sung, uh, I want you to learn these hymns. And so please, please overlook how bad a singer I am, because I'm not a very good singer. But learn the hymns. Because I tell you what, there are some spiritual songs in this book. It says, in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms. Well, psalms, of course, is the book of psalms. You know, some of the book of psalms of David in the Bible, they're actually hymns. You can not only just read them, you can start singing them. 
I've been to churches before, they say, turn to Psalm so-and-so and let's sing it. And they just sang the psalm. <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, it says here with spiritual songs. There's a lot of songs that are spiritual songs that, that talk about Christ and they talk about the things above. And they're, they just stir up your spirit. And you just say, Amen! I've been in church services where you've got four or five hundred people singing a hymn and you just start getting goosebumps and the Spirit of God just starts moving and you're just like, Amen! You can't keep silent. You know, you just get so excited. You're like, wow, it sounds like angels singing. I can't wait to get to heaven. And like I said, I'm not a good singer, but I want people to learn hymns because we're to admonish and teach one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And many of these hymns in this hymn book, whew, wow. It's like the gospel is right there in each one of the stanzas. Uh, I just sang a one here today that I was going to post here in the next couple days. And it was like, wow, four or five stanzas. It's like the gospel right there through the whole thing. So these old hymns are important to learn and to sing. And it says, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So the more you learn these hymns, the more you love these hymns, the more you sing these hymns, the, it'll help to have more grace in your heart. 17, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Now, he says this in verse 17, whatsoever you do in word or deed. So whatever you say or whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. That ties us back to verse 15, and be ye thankful. Giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So whatever we need to do, we do in Jesus' name, and we do giving thanks to God. So right now, God, I just thank you for the opportunity to use these videos to present the, the truth of the verse-by-verse -verse teaching from the Bible through these videos. I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for the hymn book and the hymns you gave and the opportunity to sing hymns and put it on YouTube, even though I'm not a good singer. I thank you for that, Lord. And I do it in Jesus' name, Lord, for you, that you get the honor and the glory, Lord. Amen. And that's what it should all be about. Now, I'm going to stop there because next time we're going to go into the marriage. Uh, it talks about wives submitting to the husbands. And it talks about husbands loving the wives. It talks about the children. And then it goes into servants. But I want to jump ahead to verse 24 because in verse 17 it says, Whatsoever you do, do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24 says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. So it's almost like he says twice, whatever you do, do in the name of the Lord and do it for the Lord. So next time we'll start there in verse 18 and go down to verse 25. And I've got a lot of things that I wanted to mention about, about the marriage relationship. We've talked about this in Ephesians chapter 5. I've already mentioned it, but I want to give and devote the entire next time to talking about that. And then we'll talk about servants, verse 22. And then verse 4 talks about masters. Verse 4, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Masters. Now, that's quite interesting. A lot of people today think slavery is so horrible, and you know, I don't like the institution of slavery. But since the beginning of time, there has been slavery. And oftentimes, when there was slavery, man owning another man, there were also laws against the masters being evil and brutal and wicked toward their slaves. There were even laws on the books in, in ancient Rome, and I believe in Greece too, that if you killed your slave, that was murder. And you could be murdered or go to jail for it. And, and capital punishment, you'd be killed. So a lot of people think, oh, it's so horrible to have slavery. It is. But in a biblical setup where God allowed slavery, and he did, there are some laws about slavery in the Old Testament. God also told the masters, now if you own a slave, this is how you're supposed to treat them. So it wasn't all about the all-powerful master being a dictator and a mean devil having dominion over and treating them like animals. There was a, I hate to say it, a symbiotic relationship there. That when a person had a slave, that slave obeyed their master and took care of them. But God said that master was supposed to take care of that slave. So they helped each other. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that maybe next time. So I appreciate you being here and once again I just want to say thank you Jesus. I want to be thankful and I also want to have charity and I want to say to everyone that I love you in the Lord. I pray for you and um, thank you for all you've done for us. We've had a lot of people send us letters, uh, send us some help and support 
a lot of people have been so good to us, and we just thank you for it. And uh, we will see you next time as we finish up Colossians chapter 3. God bless you.